Data Skeptic is the official podcast of dataskeptic.com, bringing you stories, interviews, and mini episodes on topics in data science, machine learning, statistics, and artificial intelligence. Welcome to Data Skeptic. We've seen a surge in downloads recently, which usually is an indicator that we've got a batch of new listeners. I thought it would be a good time to give a quick intro to the show for that group. Data Skeptic has an alternating format. Many of our shows are interviews with experts doing something interesting related to data science, statistics, machine learning, or artificial intelligence. On the other weeks, like today, we do these high-level discussions between Linda and myself discussing an important concept, methodology, or tool related to data. By the way, in case it's not obvious, Linda's my wife. She's very bright, as listeners know, but her background is not data science, so she helps bring a fresh perspective to these topics. I sometimes like to think of these mini-episodes like a sort of game show where I'm earning points if I manage to get her interested in the topic or get her to understand the key truth of it. One method I sometimes use for trying to do that is to relate the topic to something she's already interested in. One such go-to on the show is discussions about our pet bird, Yoshi. Yoshi is a lilac-crowned Amazon. You can actually follow her on Facebook. We usually can't have Yoshi in the studio during recording because she's really noisy when other people are talking. But on this occasion, we brought her in, and if you listen carefully, you can hear her contribute to the laugh track of this episode. Arlinda, let me ask you this. If a CEO wanted to understand whether or not their company was in a, like a healthy, stable position, what do you think they would do? She mm-hmm. <laughs> would ask their C-level people. Uh-huh. for help in, in assessing the situation for metrics, whatever KPIs or metrics or uh-huh. whatever feedback this CEO is looking for. They would ask them and be like, I want you to summarize via blah, 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 the success of blah, 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 and I want it done by this date. Can you do that for me? And what would uh, those people do to find out these answers? They would then go to their team and be like, I have a deadline, which means you have a deadline. I need you to summarize these reports to tell me how we're doing on X, Y, Z, and I need it by this date. And they would filter those results, too, to make sure that yeah, it was yeah. being communicated clearly. How would those people, the report analyzers or whatever you want to call them, how would they come back with it? Well, an if answer? they had a team, they would go to their team uh-huh. or, or, their, or their reports. It's and teams it all the way down. <laughs> yep, all the way down to the ground until they go, hey, you, tell me how it's going. And then they would summarize it in a report. What happens when someone way down the chain says, Oh my gosh, everything is terrible. The the printer is jammed. Does that mean uh, we should pass that all the way back up and tell the CEO that our company is on the brink of disaster? No, you need to tell whoever IT or facilities, whoever deals with the printer. Print, so if, if you're in the printing business and all the printers are down, yes, the CEO, she should know about it. But otherwise, while that might be the worst event in one person's life and they may be, feel totally incapable of doing their job, doesn't mean the CEO necessarily needs to know about that, right? Well, if you're if you're in the printing business, the CEO does need to know. <laughs> yeah, so the at each level there, the you know the VP director, et cetera, et cetera, they have to kind of make interpretations of the lower level reports they're getting, right? Yes, yes, they're filtering it yeah. somehow. Filtering and aggregating. That's right. So, like, if someone maybe the engineering lead goes to the developers, and the developer says, "Oh, you know, this code base is terrible. That that was here before." We should totally rewrite it in this obscure, unpopular language that I personally am interested in. You know, the manager has to assess if that's a reasonable thing or not, right? Mm -hmm. So one way to put this is that at every level of the company, there's a different level of abstraction. Different people in different ranks are concerned with different levels of detail, right? Yes. I'm concerned with very detailed things because I am a project manager. Mm -hmm. Slightly switching gears here. I'm going to show you uh, something. You tell me what are you looking at. I don't know. It just looks like a dot that has mm-hmm. white and a black edge. So I've I've covered a, a picture with an index card that has a little diamond cut in it. Well, I don't know. It what is, it, what is like the picture hole. of? I don't know. Could be a chin. Could be a chin. Let me move the picture a little bit, and then I'll ask you to guess again. I have no idea. Again, it has a light and a dark edge. Oh, but there's an edge. Oh, you're seeing something, huh? Well, before there was also a light and a dark edge. All right. So uh, what is this a picture of? I said I don't know. Why well, are you I've shown asking? you two different parts. How do you not know what this is a picture of? I'm a Lindy. <laughs> what why is this a difficult problem for you? I, I don't know. I just they just look like black and white to me. All right, let's do one more. That could be an eyebrow, but I can't tell. I'm seeing 
like light and a dark. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So how you're able to see light and dark. Do you have any guess how we could do that on a more mathematical level? No, how? So what is an image but a collection of pixels? And all pixels have intensities, right? Well, the the deepest color is black and Mm -hmm. the brightest is white. So Mm -hmm. everything between it can be a different value. And then obviously there's different colors. Yeah. So. Yeah, so for every row, you expect to go from a bright intensity to a low intensity and see that repeat itself. So can you see how mathematically we could make an edge detector by looking for these patterns of yes. high, low intensity? Okay, so that edge detector is kind of like the lowest level thing we want to do with an image. And then maybe we could assemble the edges into other things, like four edges can make a box. So if we think of our corporate analogy, maybe we can, um, the like entry level people, they're edge detectors, right? They just look at a single little th- cause like, oh, the printer is up or down. You know, we made our sale number, or we didn't for the day. And those reports all have to get aggregated. So whereas I cut a little tiny hole in a note card to show you a picture and all you could see were edges. What can you see now that I've enlarged the hole? And I'm going to show it to you again. What do you see now? Hands. Okay, so now I'm going to enlarge it. Now what kind of picture is it? Oh, it's my hands. Uh Me and Kyle were hugging at the Christmas party. Right, so how come you couldn't tell that this was a photo of us at a Christmas party the first time I showed it to you? (laughs) I guess my hand looked really big. (laughs) (laughs) I'm really shocked. (laughs) <laughs> this is like that episode of the king of queens when <laughs> they have a painting made and carrie's hand is painted too big and she doesn't like it only this is a photograph so it's the real world maybe you have giant hands Just here my hands hold yours up to mine we've already done oh my this god time. your hands are bigger <laughs> no, <they're not. laughs> they are listeners you uh you'll have to trust me i know we're not a video podcast but linda has enormous hands no Oh, no. He's lying. <laughs> um, but yeah, the point is, you're able to recognize the full picture, but your brain is is presumably doing that by assembling all the smaller level components. Yeah. Um, in kind of a hierarchical fashion. Now I want you to look at a picture uh, that I emailed you. Can you pull that up? You got four columns with three images in each column. And each image is like a... a composition of a lot of smaller images yeah right? lots of squares mm-hmm. it's rectangles that are composed of squares yep. and they're the, the smallest at the bottom and the biggest at the top and medium in the middle yeah. so start at the bottom layer and those individual squares for the time being let's call them features and i'll explain what that means in a minute what are the bottom most features you want me to look at the bottom square? Yep. It is a white and black line, and they point in various angles. Right. Now, those are actually, we could call those edge detectors, because those, if you compare them to an image, you, you know, a small part of an image, if you overlay them and multiply them by each other, more or less, then the white parts will stand out, and the black parts will obviously fade away. And if you happen to put that over a spot where there's an edge, then it will more or less kind of stay the same. You'll get a really high value. Whereas if there's not an edge there, you're going to come out with something that looks much different from the original image and you'll get a lower value when you multiply them together. Then you get one number that represents the whole little region. Now, if that number is very high, that means that the feature is present in the region. If the number is very low, then the region is probably very different from the feature. But the point is that the feature is only giving you a high value if the local part of the image is very similar to it. The feature that best aligns to the image is saying like, oh, oh, I know what this is. I recognize this part. This is what I am. It's an edge that's a horizontal edge. Mm -hmm. And that's almost like those lower level workers, right? Like, oh, the printer's not working. Small aspects of the business, but they're still important. But then the manager above them. So that's like you're in a deep learning neural network. That's your first layer of neurons. They just recognize very tiny, simple things like edges. And then above them, the manager neurons, or the first level of managers, the first hidden layer, is, I guess, the second hidden layer. They are going to look at the f- not the actual image, but the outputs of the first layer. If we think just at those basic layers in a deep learning neural network, the first layer might recognize the edges. The second layer might recognize things that are composed of edges. So if you pull up that image I sent you in an email, and I'll put this link to in the show notes so everyone else can look at it, this shows different representations. 
I should put that with an asterisk because in order to get it to look like this, they had to do a couple of steps, but we'll leave that for another time or something. But at the lowest level, you can see the bottom row are these features, these little squares, which are what different aspects of the deep learning neural network are trying to find. And they're just like edge detectors. Now, if you look above that, what do you see in the row above the bottom row? Cutouts there are look images like. yeah. zoomed in mm -hmm. and cropped in different areas. Right. So actually, they're not technically, I know to your eye, they look zoomed in and cropped. They're not actually zoomed in and cropped. These are things that emerged from the lower level components. Some of those things look like eyeballs and noses, right? Yes. So I guess technically an eyeball and a nose, these are just compositions of different types of edges. You know, an eyeball is kind of like a circle thing with maybe an eyebrow above it. A nose is sort of like a, you know, two darker spots with a brighter spot for the ridge of the nose, depending on how big your nose is. Or how small your nose is. <laughs> Do you have a nose complex? You bring this up a lot. Kyle has a big nose. Maybe my nose is average and yours is below average. I do have a small nose. It's very flat. Kyle's is very much protruding from his face. <laughs> much protruding. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> your nose protrudes from your face. <laughs> I think by definition that, with the exception of Skeletor, don't all noses protrude from my one's nose, face? My nose is very flat like Yoshi's. All right. Well, hopefully then there's more than just one nose detector in this neural network because I wanted to recognize both of our faces. But essentially what happens here in deep learning, this is why I wanted to talk about it in terms of automated feature recognition, is that at every layer you can define elements of an image based on components of the lower level image, kind of like the analogy in the company, that at every managerial level they have to synthesize the reports of the lower level people and then they themselves present a new report. Now, feature engineering is an important thing for a data scientist. We usually spend a lot of time doing stuff like this. For example, right now I'm working on a fraud detection problem. The real hard work here is not making an algorithm calculate a model, but it's deciding what types of features I want to look at. So I don't want to give away you know, any like of the trade secrets we might be developing, but it would come as no surprise that someone who you know, their billing address is in Indiana, but they're trying to make a purchase from Argentina. Now that could be valid, they could be on vacation, but that's a little bit suspicious. So that's something you want to look at and consider. And you want to consider a bunch of other stuff too, right? Like I guess a lot of fraud happens at gas stations more so than at other places, I'm told. Well, I think if you're going to steal a credit card, the first thing you do is go get gas. Do you use up a lot of gas in the act of stealing credit cards? For some it's... reason, when I had my car slash wallet stolen, uh -huh. they immediately what, went to car gas slash station. wallet? Well, my wallet was inside the car. Oh, I see. So, yes. Well, what, why did you Why did you have your car so close to empty? No, they they filled up gas multiple times. It was like they called their friends. and was like, hey, I'm just going to be at this gas station, fill it up, free fill ups. All right. So that's very suspicious behavior. Uh, a person who buys more gas than fits in a conventional car, that's not necessarily fraudulent, right? Maybe you're like two cars are going to go on vacation, you fill them up on one card, but that's pretty suspicious. Well, I wish the credit card company had had a well, detector. Well, maybe they should have hired me. <laughs> thanks, but no thanks, right? You bring up a good point. Yeah. So this is what a lot of machine learning is. It's trying to be clever come up with different ideas about what might correlate with the outcome I'm interested in and let me get that from my data and represent it and then see if the machine learning algorithm uses it. Now what's different about deep learning, and this is why people say deep learning can do automated feature recognition. Automated feature engineering means if you have a big enough data set, like a really, really big image corpus, that maybe you can ask the network to learn in these layered fashions. And we'll talk about how it does that in coming episodes, but they can start to build up these layers of abstraction. And we see some of that in that image I showed you. So let's have a little quiz now, see if you picked up anything tonight, Linda. How do you go from an image, like let's say a grayscale image that are just pixel intensities, to detecting feathers and beak and eyes? Well, first you must detect the lines. Yep. And then you make up different layers. So someone's in charge of one line, another's in charge of another line. Mm -hmm. And between that, you guys go look out for these certain lines. Yeah. And you guys compile your information. And then you said, together, we had A, B, and C. And then that means we have a face or a bird. Yep. The report that ends up on the CEO's desk says that the image has feathers, a beak, and eyeballs. 
she can make a very quick judgment. Oh, I'm, I'm able to recognize that. That's a bird. Whereas if you just tell her all of the pixel intensity, she can't do a lot with it. So how does it know the picture intensity, the weights? Oh, it has to learn them. Are you like slap it on the hand when it's wrong? More or less, yeah, <laughs> sort of. Uh, that That's a great description of reinforcement learning. That's a little different. Uh, no, for real, that's a thing we do. Um, we'll talk in future episodes because there's actually a lot of techniques, and that's kind of what we'll get into with deep learning. But that's the tricky part about it. If you have all the weights available, the problem is solved. But where did you get all these magic weights, right? Well, we'll talk about techniques coming up for how you do that. Mm, but So that's the key, where yeah. to draw the line. Yeah, yeah. The different value scales. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Got it. And you do it by learning from the training data, but you have to use some very clever algorithms. And we'll get into those in future mini episodes. Okay. Well, if you build one, I want a bird image recognition. A bird detector? Bird detector. I'm sure there's one out there. I bet with Cafe probably has that built in. I'll, I'll look around. I'll see what's already off the shelf available. I mean, you could put Yoshi's photo through. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, thanks as always for joining me, Lindy. Thank you. And until next time, I want to remind everyone to keep thinking skeptically of and with data. Good night. Good night. Data Skeptic is a listener-supported program. To support the show, visit dataskeptic.com and click on the membership tab.